and welcome to Televisia Republica. Estonia's Foreign Intelligence Service warns that Russia is gearing up for a military confrontation with the West within the next decade, urging a counter buildup of armed forces in response. This assessment raises amidst increasing concerns from Western officials about Russia's threat to NATO's eastern flank, prompting calls for rearmament in Europe. The intelligence chief highlighted Russian plans to double its forces along the borders with NATO members, Finland, Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia, indicating a long-term strategy of confrontation anticipated by the Kremlin. Although a military attack by Russia is deemed highly unlikely in the short term due to its military commitments in Ukraine, the risk escalates without a comparable build-up of forces in Europe. Estonia and other Baltic states have ramped up military spending to over 2% of their GDP post-Crimea annexation in 2014, with NATO allies bolstering their presence Germany is set to station 4,800 combat-ready troops in the region by 2027. I wonder, what's the reason for which it takes them so long? Anyway, marking its first permanent foreign deployment since World War II. <laughs> I mean, calling the German activity outside its borders in Europe a long-term commitment itself raises lots of questions and concerns in this part of the world. However, the real threat right now, and that's pretty obvious, is Russia. The intelligence service, Estonian intelligence service, stresses the importance of continued or increased Western support for Ukraine as Russia's ammunition supply capabilities outstrip those of Ukraine, affecting the battlefield dynamics. Almost 80 pages report is a thorough assessment of various Russian assets in this war waged against Ukraine on one hand and against the collective West in a broader manner. According to the Estonian intelligence community, Russia's ability to mobilize large numbers of personnel is noted, but its failure to provide adequate training limits military success. That's a quote. Russia has demonstrated its ability to mobilize and recruit a large number, large number of personnel, but has struggled to provide them with proper training, end quote. The report points to contradiction between tactical advancements and strategic limitations. Despite tactical advancements, Russia is unlikely to conduct well-led major joint operations. Another quote, Russia is likely to persist with its extensive attrition-based warfare against Ukraine in 2024, Estonian secret services claim that troop recruitment is the issue from the Russian perspective. A detailed look at Russia's recruitment campaign reveals its reliance on financial incentives and the significant challenges it faces. Another quote, the largest contingent of recruits were reservists. The main obstacle to recruitment is fear of war, end quote. The document critics the quality and effectiveness of Russia's military training, impacting combat readiness and operational success, another quote. Many mobilized and recruit individuals have been sent to the front with only basic training, end quote. Nothing new, we've heard that over and over again, but still. Russia, according to Estonians, is presenting a hostile, posture in the context of perceived NATO expansion, focusing on increasing personnel and establishing new units. Well, we kind of know it from various Vladov Putler's statements. Another quote, Russia presents its military reform as a response to NATO's expansion, yet yeah, we know that's the way they view it. Russia is restructuring military command. The reform includes significant changes in military command structure. Russia aims to bolster capabilities, especially in strategic directions. The reform will dissolve joint strategic commands and revert to a structure based on military branches 
and Services report reads. Russia's ambition plan to increase its military force includes adding new units to enhance its strategic posture. Russia aims to increase its military personnel from 1.15 million to 1.5 million soldiers by 2026. And quote, Russia does it because it expects that it is going to wage long wars. The document discusses the capacity of Russian, Russia's military industrial complex to support ongoing operations in Ukraine. Another quote, Russia, Russia's advantage over Ukraine in terms of available artillery ammunition will likely continue to grow in 2024, reads the report. The report also addresses the significant losses of Russian armored vehicles and strategic to compensate for these losses. Russian armed forces have lost exceedingly high number of armored vehicles. The Estonian assessment of the Russian military activity is an interesting report, but even most interesting intelligence documents are nothing compared to real combat videos. This war, in that term, is like no other war in the history, but those footage from another marine drones destroying Russian vessel are really huge. Another Russian vessel promoted to submarine big time. You can join us on rackracon.com. That's our website. We try to publish daily reports based on intelligence documents and other reports that we find while digging in the internet, trying to get you closer to the information available about the war against the West that we try to report on my program. My name is Michał Rachony. This is Rack Racon. And we roll it. Are you ready? Three, two, one, go! One and only Rip Rollings is again on Televizia Republica, again on Rack Racon Rip. I haven't seen you for a while. Great to have you again on our program. Uh, in the new settings. You are in the new settings and lots of very interesting weapons behind you. So before we move <laughs> to the uh, issues regarding the, the, the Russian war in Ukraine, let's start with the weapons you have over there. Could you walk us through the devices that, well, that we can see? Yeah, you asked me to pull this one off the wall. Yeah. So this is the one I wanted to show uh, off a little bit. This is uh, called the Chris Super V and uh, it's it's actually a fairly new weapon. It's about 10 years old. Uh, uh -huh. It has a really short throw, so the, the bolt uh, only comes back you know, so far. Uh -huh. And the uh -huh. real unique feature about it is, and it's being tested by Army Natick Labs uh, to be used mainly for guys that are in vehicles. So if you're a vehicle guy, this kind of straps on okay. almost like a pistol. It's got a collapsible buttstock up here, so you uh -huh. can shorten the stock and put it inside a holster. Uh -huh. um, it's a short-barreled rifle, but it can be carried tactically. And kind of the best part about it is this is a holographic side on the top. Okay. But uh, the best part about it is it shoots 45 ACP. So it shoots a, a pistol round, but it's extremely stable, mainly because, and I, I sound like an advertiser for the company now. I'm not making any money off this. <laughs> no, but that's very interesting. But so <laughs> It is, yeah. So this, the, the, the most interesting feature is the bolt actually cantilevers down into the uh, lower receiver here. Okay. So the bolt, when it comes back, you can see the barrel over here. This uh -huh. is a short barrel and the bolt comes back and goes downwards. Uh, when I was with a Marine Corps FAST, that's Fleet Anti-Terrorism Security Team, we used to use uh, MP5. We had a fair amount of different weapon systems. And the biggest thing that we had a problem with was barrel rides. Uh -huh. When you fire a weapon in full auto or if you even fire it in burst, um, even just in general, if you're firing a lot of rounds downrange, the barrel tends to go up a lot yeah, uh -huh. uh, on some of these smaller weapons because they don't, they're not as stabilized, they don't have a, as long a barrel. Uh, obviously, they don't have a recoil mechanism in the buttstock. This thing doesn't have one at all. But this one, the company, Chris, came up with a fantastic new idea, and the bolt actually cantilevers back down into the lower receiver, and they say it combats 95% of barrel rise. I would okay. say 
you know, probably more like 75%, but it means that you can really mm -hmm. pull a trigger uh, and you just, it stays right on target. It barely rises at all. Yeah, so the, I, always, I the issue, always the issue if you are if you are using a firearm while driving, yeah. uh, at least for civilian use, there is an issue of uh, your seat belt. So I assume that this can be with, with this with this folded uh, parts of this of this weapon. This can be also yeah. used in that in that manner. Very interesting. So good weapon. <laughs> great to hear it from from the expert. Good to see you too. Yep. <laughs> Rip, great to see you uh, again. Uh, I remember our conversations uh, at the beginning of this uh, of, of this war almost two years yeah. ago. Actually, in ten days we are going to have the second anniversary of the outburst of the full-scale invasion of Russia on on Ukraine. And I remember you uh, focusing our attention on naval drones. Uh, right. In a time when where actually no one ever no, no one heard about those devices, we got another big news regarding the exploding of, huge. of yeah huge thing. I mean, and the thing is that like three weeks ago we've seen a uh, Ukrainian uh, drone, naval drone, on uh, weapons trade fair uh, being produced and being presented as a part of I understand it as a. Uh, as a completely new weapon, which is being delivered to the to the markets also outside Ukraine, and it this is this is this is my uh, this is the way I see it, that we've actually seen live or almost live a completely new type of weapon being introduced and actually winning an important part of this war, which is, which is containing the Black Sea fleet. Your take on, on those things, and, and what, what do we know yeah. about the latest episodes of using those drones? So obviously, we're on the heels of a very big Valentine's Day massacre, <laughs> uh, which is a pretty big deal, obviously, the United States, the Valentine's it. Day massacre. <laughs> and uh, what happened was we had a Russian ship, almost said Soviet there for a minute, but the, of the Black Sea fleet. It is, it's called the Cesar, and I'm going to mispronounce the last name, but it was right off of, it was right near Sevastopol, south and east of Sevastopol near Kopinsk, if I'm saying that correctly. Uh, and I'm just, you know, getting uh, fresh with some of the names on these these items, these places. But what happened was something that you and I have talked about on your program, and as a refresher for everybody, these sea drones, naval drones, are, in my mind, a strategic game changer. Uh, you have extremely expensive fleets, U.S. and otherwise, out there uh, sailing the seas that can be hobbled or crippled or even destroyed, as we saw recently, and sunk by something as simple as, you know, 250, 280 kilograms worth of explosives on this small ship that's low in the water, that's completely remote controlled. And, the, you know, the, the details given to us by the Ukrainians are kind of scant. We're going to have to make some assumptions. They said 400 nautical mile radius. Every time any new weapon system comes out, they dumb it down a little bit. Every you know, U.S., when we develop new weapon systems, we always say, well, we can see out to, you know, eight kilometers. In actuality, it's more like 12 or 15. Uh, in the case of this one, when it says 400 nautical miles, I'm going to give them another 50, maybe even 80 nautical miles of that, basically takes them across the breadth of the majority of the Black Sea. Now, that's a big deal. If you can get under the bridge, you can get into some of Russia's most, uh, you know, secure ports, uh, their portages up there have a lot of natural barriers that prevent anybody from harming them. This one uh, hit, obviously, outside of that zone, but still shows or demonstrates to Russia that they have the reach with a relatively cheap weapon system to destroy something extremely expensive uh, like the Cesar that was attacked and destroyed uh, as of reports of today. Again, Valent St. Valentine's Day Massacre looks fairly bloody on the Russian side. <laughs> well, it's it's a good title. Yeah, it's a good title also for our YouTube. So probably this is yeah. going to be the title. But, uh, <laughs> Reap, what we saw on the footage uh, that uh, we actually can present it also to our, our viewers from this, this trade fair footage looks yeah. like, a, like a motorboat. Uh, mm -hmm. With some electronic devices, to me it looks like I don't know if it's if it, that's the Starlink, but it looks like a satellite antenna very similar to uh, to Starlink uh, technology. Uh, yeah. We have some 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 parts of it looks like a radio um, wave communication uh, devices. Lots of right. uh, lots of explosives, or I don't know how yeah. much, but but 
surely enough to, uh, to, 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 to sink the, the ships that, that actually those weapons uh, did. And that's all. So what's the difference between the cost of those two ships that were uh, sank like, I don't know, last two weeks or last three weeks yeah. and cost of, let's say, five of those naval drones? Because in the case of the first of those two, uh, we have reports about five naval drones used to, to attack and, 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 and put it to the bed of the Black Sea. Yeah. So great question. Obviously, you always come up with big ones and these it has strategic significance. So obviously you're homing in on something extremely important about this device, which is it costs in the order of tens of millions to hundreds of millions uh, to some kind of times in the case of billions for, for ships uh, of the size of the Cesar to be produced. Uh, that one's on the lower scale because it's a troop transportation ship. But, you know, think about aircraft carriers certainly run in the billions. And those vessels take between five to ten years to build. They're brought to a shipyard. You use a tremendous amount of steel. Obviously, they put the latest and greatest technology into them. Uh, and, you know, generally what we saw when I was in the Naval Services, the United States Marine Corps back in the day, is they're putting in the technology that's relevant to the day. But, you know, it takes 10 years to build it. Uh, there's usually they try to upgrade even during that time of something off the shelf uh, that comes out. They call it COTS, commercial off the shelf. And if something big comes in, they try to put it onto that. But then think of the, sh the life cycle of a naval ship. It's out in the fleet for, you know, 20, 30, 50 years in the case of aircraft carriers. And so that's a long time where technology starts to degrade. Now, what we're looking at, though, is a extremely relevant, extremely new series of systems. You said Starlink. If you look at the picture uh, behind you, you can see that kind of circular or cylindrical device on the back. That is the satellite uplink device. Um, it's going to give them fairly stable satellite uh, communications. I imagine there's some autonomy inside the actual housing that allows it to steer itself through navigation points using its own GPS. On the front or closer to the bow of this vessel, you can see what is actually a 360 degree camera. Uh, that's going to be something that cycles regularly and sends uplink images and shows them what's going on. Now, that technology is new as of right now. It's not 10, 30 or 50 years old. It's new as within the past days, weeks, months, meaning the greatest part about this uh, thing and, and probably what makes it the most game changing is that they're able to put today's technology into it that gives it faster uplink speeds, which means quicker communications, more agile, more able to move up uh, onto the target. Uh, it's painted in a camouflage pattern. It's low in the water. It's very uh, difficult to see. It's not a submarine, but those are probably next. We do know that the U.S. has some submersible autonomous vehicles. Uh, semi-autonomous, meaning they get some uh, communications from above. But this is the wave of the future. It is going to, we see this in a lot of battlefields. We've seen it through history. Any of those of your uh, viewers who are st students of history know these kinds of things creep up on the battlefield. They're relevant technology that someone says, well, let's build one of these now because it makes sense based on what we have. They build it and everyone in the world goes, oh, ha, aha, this is a big deal. Because uh, now you can take out a you know, billion plus carrier with a small device that costs in the, you know, tens of thousands. Yeah, that's a big, big deal. That, that's, that's a huge thing, because I remember at the first days of this full scale uh, invasion, we were talking that this is a kind of a war of drones. I, I wonder if yeah. this war will broke down in the history as a first real drone war. And we were thinking yeah. about Bayraktars. We were thinking about the way that those small commercial drones change the situational awareness of the troops right. on, the, on the battlefield. We are talking about, about those FPVs, uh, super fast drones that are exploding uh, next to a baby or next to a, a single soldier. But now we are talking about the changing of the, uh, actually containing the superpower uh, Black Sea Fleet, which was basically the reason for which uh, Crimea was illegally annexed by uh, Russia. And we are witnessing uh, changing the, the tides of uh, at least the, the, the naval part of this war with those devices. Uh, how will it change the way that wars are waged on the oceans uh, uh, since now? Because it looks like yeah. you just said, said that this is a game changer. So what will change? How do you fight this kind of threats? Right, right. Yeah, so, you know, this is similar to a torpedo. So in some regards, some of the old things that we did during World War II, which are double bulkheads in order to prevent torpedo strikes from uh, having an advantage, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do trying to jam it, of course. but all of that uh, t doesn't really answer the question that you asked. The question you asked is, you know, it does this change things, and it does in, in the long run. Um, 
this is ha this war has a very unfortunate aspect to it, which is you have two very large conventional forces fighting each other. Look at the wars I fought in Iraq and Afghanistan, North Africa. We use drones. We use them regularly. I remember the first time I got a drone uh, to use down at the company level. This is back in you know uh, nineteen. You know, or sorry, 2001, 2002. Uh, these are small devices. They weren't very handy. You know, the, the cameras on them weren't very effective, et cetera. But we thought, boy, this is a changer, game changer, because here on the battlefield, me as just a lowly captain, I'm able to get 360 degree uh, kind of aerial surveillance out to about, you know, 50, 80, 100 kilometers very effectively. Now, the drones we have today have significantly different. We're talking about waterborne, but airborne as well. Uh, and you have to take a look at some of the groundborne as well. We've got you know, smaller remote control or radio controlled uh, cars or devices that are able to slip explosives uh, relatively simply. The airborne drones have been the most effective, um, but it has changed something else significant, which is when you have two conventional forces fighting each other, typically we think of conventional forces, large tanks, lots of artillery, big movements, and the infantry scale is now at battalion, brigade, regiment levels. In this instance, the individual is now important again. One guy with a radio-controlled device can take out a four- or a five-man armored personnel carrier or tank. Um, now, that's been the case since World War II with RPGs, but obviously with a rocket-propelled grenade, I had to get me and my forces within a couple hundred meters of a tank. Well, that's well within the lethality radius of that tank and its infantry as well. So we're still back to kind of toe-to-toe, tay-a-tay. However, with drones, I'm a couple, you know, 50, 80 kilometers, whatever the case is, depending on the drone, and I'm able to slip a munition in there that's able to take a very valuable piece off of the chessboard, uh, which is a tank, which obviously, you know, the heavy armor is stuff that me as a reconnaissance guy or an infantry guy, uh, we hated tanks. You know, it's a big beast. It's, it's a worrisome thing to have out there, uh, especially if it's out looking for you. So the waterborne version of it, just as frightening, you're not combating one guy versus a tank. It's going to be a, a, a data systems, uh, a group of people at a command and control center uh, in Ukraine, a five, six, eight man team. But they're going up against, you know, a 50, 80, 120 man ship that just doesn't have the technology right now to deal with this. Besides, as we've seen in a lot of videos, firing just direct fire yeah, cannon fire. The rattlings, yeah, I the mean, rattlings against those, right. those things in the last second. Uh, in the last second, you're, you're in within a couple hundred meters yeah. and this boat is, you know, coming at you full speed. You got seconds to take it out. It's reminiscent of World War II and the kamikaze airstrikes in Japan. Uh, as the U.S. and its uh, allies. Yeah, the difference is there, there is no one there, so you're not losing right. manpower. But th my That's final right. question regarding this part of, of, of our conversation, because there are also very interesting things uh, on the strategic level going on uh, right now. But uh, surely our viewers know the, the, the videos published by, I think, Boston Technologies. That's the name right. of the company that is working on soldiers or yeah. artificial, artificial soldiers, whatever you, yep. you call it, just the devices that reassemble human being or a dog or, yeah. or, or some other, uh, I even know how to call it, a creature that is able to fight uh, autonomously, not being a human, but having the uh, capabilities and the movements of... of uh, is that the direction the military and, and the wars of future are, are going to move? It is. It's, it's interesting to see because we always say uh, that, uh, you know, the necessity is the mother of invention, okay? And, and really what that means is that when you have forces like Ukraine in the midst of a war, they're going to be more quick to adapt uh, commercial off the shelf, that COTS technology we just talked about, to, the, to weapons of war. The U.S. And, and larger countries have been Adapting this technology, obviously very intricate technology, very expensive technology. You mentioned uh, uh, the Boston uh, company, Boston Technologies, or whatever it's called, that made this robot dog. We had a chance when I was a battalion commander, we, had, we were the first battalion to test out a whole series of drones. Some of them had tracks with machine guns on the top. <clears throat> Some of them, uh, you know, the Boston uh, Technologies dog was used as a pack animal. We didn't test it, but another unit did. Uh, and, you know, that thing can go pretty far. It was fairly loud at the time. Uh, it was very agile. It could get over rocks. It was relatively autonomous, although it liked to follow troops. Uh, it had a follow me feature. Um, you know, and some of that technology, my troops looked at it and I said, you know, how is this drone working with this? You know, it was about the size of a, uh, a motorcycle uh, in kind of length and it had a, a, a 
50 caliber machine gun on the top. And they said, sir, it sucks. I said, well, what's wrong with it? <laughs> I said, well, you know, everybody can see it. If it takes five or six bullets, it's down. It's always going to have to be overt. It can't climb stairs. It can't hide behind walls. So the thing is going to be kind of front and center. They said, but we like the fact that it's going to take the first bullet. I was like, well, yeah, that's pretty <laughs> handy. I mean, it's, you know, that's pretty good. I mean, at the price, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, uh, you'd wish it would take a little more damage. But they did say, it, you know, again, necessity being the mother of invention, we can, they said, sir, we can infiltrate this into Overwatch because it has great night vision capability and I can fire support by fire with this thing from another location. I thought, so even the troops were looking at ways to adapt kind of that technology. Yeah, and use my it. Point, yeah, my point in all this is to say that we're seeing these rapid revolutions in Ukraine that larger countries are just not doing because, you know, they're taking in Ukraine all of this basic civilian technology and adapting it uh, for the fight. And it's obviously extremely effective. Now, all of that said, it means that every single large nation in the world is paying attention and saying, oh, my gosh, you know, this drone boat could take out a much larger craft. It's very hard to cripple yeah. or take care of. Uh, we can try to jam it, but it's probably not going to be that effective. Yeah. So you can read my next book, by the way, because we do have some of these waterborne drones in that uh, next version of red metal out on the market, hopefully in the next year or so. But yeah, I think it's significant. When the, book, when the, when the book is available on Amazon, just let us know. We're going to talk about we'll it as we read Rip's uh, books, novels. Very interesting. Also about the part of the world where I where I uh, live. Reap, uh, you mentioned yeah. the thing uh, of, of, well, the, the problem of the troops, and you mentioned that all the countries, all the smaller and bigger nations are, are, are paying attention to what is going on in, in Ukraine. Estonia published its yearly uh, right. intelligence report, uh, and basically, as Estonia is one of the Baltic states uh, and is one of the important states of the eastern NATO uh, flank, it is mainly about Russia. Uh, we had a couple of interesting observations over there. Yeah. Among them, the observation regarding troops and military mobilization of Russia and challenges related to this. They say that they are going, that Russia is going to fight a war of attrition against uh, Ukraine, but that they do have problem and ch the, the, the challenge for Russia is to mobilize troops because of fear of war. I wonder what yeah. do you make of those most important points of, of this 80-page report that you can read the readouts on, uh, on, on our yeah. Substack? So the, 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 the intelligence report, in my mind, was very succinct. It, it was uh, Obviously, it's very lengthy, but it does go into great detail and a terrific analysis. There's a few things that... I mean, so first of all, flat out, it, I think it gets the majority of what we expect uh, right uh, it's not very difficult. A lot of what it says in there is stuff that's, you know, fairly predictable. All the stuff that we've talked about on your show in general, which is the Russians are having a difficult time uh, raising their army. There is a tremendous fear in the draft age military male that they're going to go off and have to fight in Ukraine. And obviously that they have technological disadvantages. They have strategic training disadvantages. That was another key point inside the report. And so their troops are going to war, you know, at a great disadvantage in general. All of that's true, but you have to also, you can't look at that in a vacuum. Ukraine is in the same boat, in fact, probably worse. Ukraine has the advantage of a lot of Western weapons, and hopefully we're seeing a fair amount of Western training, uh, the F-16s, that kind of thing, being some of the latest and greatest of that. But they're in kind of the same boat, which is they're training as fast as they can. They have a depleting population of males. Uh, all of the males are front and center with the war every day. Uh, so if you haven't volunteered for the Army yet, um, you know, likely you're going to be asked to join before too long because Ukraine has a smaller population. All of that said, I will say that there's a few things that were absent in the intelligence report. And I'll put it this way. They said that it's a war of attrition, but there's a part of that that I really disagree with. I think that the amount of munitions that Russia has still in its stockpile is extremely significant. And I believe we're going to see that come to play here in this spring offensive. In fact, I think this is going to be probably the worst aspect of the war. And I think in the very unfortunate anniversary that you mentioned, the two-year anniversary of, of the war in Ukraine, we're going to see Russia throwing massive amounts of artillery right as we get within two weeks or so of the spring thaw. Now, Russia learned a lesson that every nation has learned fighting in that region before, which is the spring thaw in that area really sucks, and I mean mud. You've got uh, everything, to, all of that permanent, not permanent, but all that frozen uh, tundra, if you will, kind of unfreezes, and everything with tracked and wheel vehicles become, becomes almost impassable. Russia, in all of its history, has been very adept at fighting 
kind of or beginning its major offensive just before the spring thaw, a couple weeks before, trying to push the enemy off balance because most ever since the the dawn of man fighting one another, you always launch your offensives in the, in the spring. Um, I think this spring in particular is going to be a tremendous amount of artillery fired at the front lines. And I'm afraid to say I think they're going to make some gains because it's going to be not hours of artillery fire, not, you know, days of artillery fire, but multiple days where they just bombard everything within a 5, 10 kilometer uh, radius of a front and then push through, as Russia has always liked to do, over the dead bodies of their enemies. So I, I'm, I'm very worried about what's going to happen. I didn't see that really spoken about in the Estonian report, although, like I said, uh, and you mentioned that they did say a war of attrition. But I think there's another aspect to this, and we can get into it in greater depth, but Russia also knows this is a strategic uh, opportunity for them right now because the U.S. is in an election cycle. And we can get into it as much depth as you like, but yeah, I, I wonder. We we, 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 yeah. had, we had a very interesting conversation yesterday with, right. with Professor Strand on this, but we, we didn't actually touch up on. We, we, we focused mainly on the on the internal uh, uh, political border lines in U.S. But what yeah. you are actually mentioning is something that really is fundamental here. What is the way that Russia is trying to capitalize on the fact that we are uh, just uh, at the doorstep of the presidential? Uh, 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 election in the U.S. Yeah, Russia, in the sense of how it analyzes things strategically, is not always that difficult to figure out. Sometimes we think it's a big mystery, um, but oftentimes it's very black and white. And in the case of U.S. elections, Russia, for almost its entire history as an adversary against the United States, has used the election cycles to its advantage, whether it's in negotiating uh, nuclear uh, uh, non-proliferation treaties, whether it's assisting and aiding uh, in Vietnam, as it did and China did uh, during election cycles, or even uh, when the, the Paris Treaty came about at the end of that war, uh, they waited for election cycles in order to do kind of their most harm. So I would expect to see them do everything they can to make advances. They've got an indication from Ukraine that uh, Ukraine will listen to the United States when it comes to negotiations. Um, and I think you've got a Biden administration that's dealing with war fatigue in the United States. Uh, not me, but uh, there's a lot of people that are, are hoping that we'll get out uh, of the, the support and assistance uh, to the war. I'm the opposite mindset, but it, that mindset is very prevalent. The unfortunate part being that where the U.S. goes, Europe generally follows, not to say that you know the U.S. is the world leader anymore in that sense, but certainly uh, if we're giving billions of dollars in aid, uh, it, it's not gonna be matched if we step back and say, we're not gonna do that anymore. I think you can look at the political tea leaves and see what uh, former President Trump has to say about his uh, motivations in Ukraine, not much, and uh, President Biden with his dwindling support in general, and Russia says, we've got an opportunity. You can throw in there that, uh, you know, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin obviously has gotten gravely sick, um, you know, looks like it's been taken care of. But on the other hand, maybe it hasn't. He was not very forthcoming with what was wrong with him and certainly didn't uh, notify the public. Sounds like he also didn't notify some people in kind of the president's inner circle as well. That is something else that Russia will perceive as a great weakness. I'll throw this in there, and this is going to sound sexist, but again, I'm just interpreting Russia's perspective on this. The deputy secretary of defense is a female, the first ever. Uh, so congratulations, obviously, to her. But on the other hand, Russia will perceive that as a weakness as well. And we'll say, well, look, all of the, the stars are lining up for us. Ukraine is on its heels. They're not getting as much uh, support from the West as prior. U U.S. is in an election cycle, which we can help sway by taking ground and killing Ukrainians. Uh, and also, you know, both political parties uh, in the United States are not going to support this too much. If we can get the U.S. to back off, we can get most of Europe to back off. And that looks like a win. And oh, by the way, there's instability inside the Department of, of Defense in the United States. Now, I'll counter that and say there's no instability, having worked in that five-sided uh, funny palace, as we used to call it, the, the Pentagon, I'll say that it's extremely stable. Uh, you could lose the, 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 the Secretary of Defense, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, and everything would go on just as normal. We have a very stable chain of command. I was the nuclear, I had the misfortune of being the nuclear officer for the Marine Corps and watched the chain of, of command in action, I could say, uh, it's pretty much infallible. I, I don't think there's many people that could have invented a better system. If everybody gets wiped out, including the president, we'll still be able to kick ass. That still works. That still, yeah. that still works. Reap, uh, we got to go.
Uh, the yep. time is up. Uh, always a pleasure. Uh, our Absolutely. viewers should also subscribe to Reap Rowling's uh, Subscribe. He's also uh, sub Substack, of course. He's also present there. So, uh, so do it. Follow um, uh, Reap's uh, thoughts and Reap's uh, ideas. You can do it on Substack as well. Reap, thank you very much. Uh, looking Terrific. forward to, to meet you Great again. Waiting you. for your new book. Uh, yep. So uh, a lot of good reading comes uh, to Amazon and other uh, bookstores when the new novel is ready. Thanks a lot, Reap. See you soon. Take care. See you soon. Ciao. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. Subscribe to rackracon.com. You can find us uh, here on, uh, on the website that most of our new viewers probably know. You can leave us your email. We will send you the reports uh, and analyzes from the front lines of the war against the West that we try to cover on this program. See you soon. Ciao, ciao. Bye.